financial protection for employees, and most importantly, we'll analyze employment discrimination protections. Now, why this matters, understanding contract agreements can help prevent disputes that might arise. You can also limit liability for the business customer claims, and you can help navigate the legal system if your business faces a lawsuit. So it's important to have a foundation of some of these important principles, regulations that exist, so you understand your rights as well as your workers. Now, before we get started, one point I want to make regarding employment law is that while many of these regulations exist to help prevent bad conduct and to help provide consequences for it, in reality, some of these things don't work so well. For instance, we'll find out today that you have some protections if you need family medical leave for something like a pregnancy or if someone in your family falls ill. However, while you can take 12 weeks off of work, you'll find out today that it has to be unpaid. And in many situations, a person is not able to take three months of time off work without a paycheck coming in unless they have ample savings. Most of us are living paycheck to paycheck in a manner that just doesn't make this feasible. So keep that in mind as we walk through all the different regulations and the law today. Now think about how would you prove this in a courtroom and what happens from a practical sense. And I'll try to share some anecdotes in that regard as well. So our first topic for today is to talk about some current regulations that exist regarding employment security. Keep in mind that without a contract, a worker is known as what's called an employee at will. That means he or she can be fired or they can quit a job for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all, as long as it's not discriminatory. So there's some benefits to you for this. You're not stuck in your job if you hate it. You have a right to leave. While it's nice to give a couple weeks notice you know, to help provide them some time to find a replacement and to get them up to speed. You're not required legally to do anything but quit, okay? Likewise, it gives your employer the benefit to let you go. And so unless you have some extra contract involved on your job, you might have collective bargaining that we'll talk about in a moment, a union that helps make sure you have a certain agreements about what they must go through and procedures they must go through in addition to the law to help protect your job. In general, most of us are employed at will and we can be let go uh, for any reason at any time. Now, one of the first regulations in terms of employment and security to discuss is what's known as the National Labor Relations Act or the Wagner Act. This created the National Labor Relations Board to help enforce labor laws. One big area of this regulation is to prohibit employers from penalizing workers who engage in union activity. Okay, for example, trying to form a union or being a part of one that exists already. And it requires that employers bargain in good faith with their unions. A union is a group of people who come together on the job to try to help make sure that they're being treated fairly. Okay, this is something that started some time ago because you could see workers getting mistreated, you know, because there were other people that could just fill their role. So if Hannah's doing a bad job, we replace Hannah with another worker. The employer doesn't have to care. And I can't do much about it. Now, if I quit my job today, yeah, they might be upset, but I can be replaced, right? Even if they might not be as good, they could be better. I can be replaced. Whereas if every worker in the job you're currently in, the job I'm in, or even if you're not working, when you start working, if every worker walks out that same day, it's going to have much more power than you doing it alone. While you can replace one person pretty easily, it's harder to replace a whole group. And suddenly a large knowledge base just walked out the door. So we see that coming together in a collective bargaining union in a union can provide some ample benefits. Okay. Some employers frown on unions, you know, but this act helps make sure that they're being treated fairly. Now, some people like unions because they help make sure that you have an advocate in the workplace. You do see other sides to that. There are some places that feel that people take advantage of some of the protections that unions put in place. So that's something you might be interested in learning more about, and you certainly can by going to the link here. We're going to be talking about a lot of different laws that may interest you today, and as with the entire class, it's important to make sure you dive in deeper if there's an area of interest that's specific to you. So you will find links to do just that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Family and Medical Leave Act is something that was at, passed pretty recently in 1993, and it guarantees both men and women up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave each year 
for things like childbirth, adoptions, medical emergencies, and that's for themselves or a family member. Now, keep in mind there's some restrictions for a lot of the laws we talk about today. This law only applies if there's at least 50 workers at the company, and they have to have been with, you have to have been with the company full-time for at least a year, which is only about 60% of all employees that are represented then by this law. Before a worker returns from FMLA, an employer may also require what's known as a fitness for duty evaluation to confirm that they can perform the essential functions of the job. And it also offers important protections, okay, but it doesn't provide for things like mandatory paid maternity leave, and the United States is the only rich country that doesn't provide this. So while you can get 12 weeks unpaid leave um, when you're going through something like you know childbirth, it's unpaid. And on top of that, you may not be able to keep your health insurance that if you're receiving it from your employer while using FMLA, and you probably need it if you're using this um, to your benefit. So most of us live paycheck to paycheck, and taking 12 weeks of unpaid leave, even if our job will still be there when we get back, as this law protects it, is something that's difficult to do. Okay, but this is the law that helps give us some time off. Um, and helps guarantee we'll have our job back even if it's unpaid. So that you can access more information at the departmentoflabor.gov site. Now health insurance is another big part of the job that's changed in recent years due to what many of you might know to as Obamacare or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as the ACA or PAPACA. Before companies were not required to provide their employees with health insurance, many did as a benefit and to be competitive but they weren't required to do so. This legislation actually specifies that back in 2014, employers who had more than 50 full-time employees would face a penalty if they didn't provide basic health insurance. It also provides extra protections like uh, the insurance policies have to cover employees' children of up to age 26. So suddenly you could remain on a family plan under your parents' health insurance up to age 26. Um, it also says that there cannot be anyone refused health insurance for things like a pre-existing condition. For example, a health insurance company can't turn you down because you have um, diabetes. So this is something you might want to learn more about. You can do so by going to our U.S. Department of Health and Human Services site where you can find more information about health care rights. Okay, keep in mind laws like this, again, from a practical sense, it's made to help us and to help guarantee us further access to health care. However, some employers didn't love this uh, because it made it so that it, may, it had a lot of extra money and costs that they just couldn't afford. You know, when you're barely, barely breaking even as a business, something like this could shut your business down. You know, also, if you're on the border, you have 52 full-time employees. There were some employees who were impacted because suddenly the business, you know, either laid them off to stay below this threshold or they transitioned many of their full-time workers into part-time workers so they wouldn't be subject to this law, causing issues for those employees. So there are many benefits that the law created, but it's controversial because it also created some problems, especially for businesses. You know, so it's a good to learn more about if it interests you. COBRA, you see the snake on the screen. Um, losing your job does not mean that you also have to give up your health insurance. COBRA, the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, provides former employees of companies with 20 or more employees so we don't have that 50 threshold here, just 20. Uh, 20 employees, they have to be allowed to continue the health insurance for 18 months, so about a year and a half after leaving their job. Now there's a catch. Employers don't have to pay for it. So employees have to, and in fact, there's this 2% administrative expense, so you're really paying 102% of the cost of your health insurance, and probably your employer was paying half or more before, so you'll notice a significant increase in those costs. And you can learn more at the Department of Labor site listed on the screen. Now, in speaking about some of the security regulations in the workplace, wrongful discharge is another important concept. This prohibits employers from firing a worker for a reason that violates basic social rights, duties, or responsibilities. So while you are an employee at will, they cannot let you go for refusing to violate a law or exercising a legal right, or performing a legal duty, something like jury duty, for example. Contract law also provides additional protections. If you'll, you'll see generally an employee handbook exists in your workplace that creates a contract with extra protections. For instance, you may be 
the employer may be required to provide written notice of any kind of wrongdoings on the job to allow you the opportunity to fix that problem before simply letting you go. Now legally that's not required, but it may be something that they're agreeing to in an employee handbook. So keep in mind those agreements that are created so they're not breaching contract law that exist in addition to the employment at will. Now defamation is another security area for the workplace. Employers can be liable for defamation, defamation if they give false and unfavorable references about a former employee. More than half of the states recognize some sort of qualified privilege, a protection unless state, the statement is known to be false or given ill will for former employers who give references. Generally, employers are really not required to give any information about former employees, but they can be held liable if they give potentially dangerous information if they choose not to give that. So let me share some examples to help illustrate this. Okay. Defamation causes problems for companies okay, because if I'm giving a reference and it's causing someone not to get their job, they can come after me then and sue me. Okay, whether it's valid or not, you know, we have this he said, she said thing going on and they're arguing they didn't get the job because of me. We run into an issue where I can face, you know, a lot of legal obligations, even if I'm in the right. So to avoid this, most companies actually have a policy in place where they'll simply state the dates of employment, your title, and whether or not you're eligible for rehire. They will not say things like, I fired this person. And by having that policy, I can't make an argument that they said more to defame me in some way and avoid these type of defamation suits by having that policy in place. Now, in reality, most business owners, you know, are small business owners and may not be familiar with some of the laws that exist regarding references. And they might think it's their obligation to say, hey, Hannah was a terrible employee and to share that information. And they may never know that, you know, legally they shouldn't be doing that. And I may never know that that reference is the reason why I'm not getting the job. It's hard to find out that someone's saying bad things about you and that's the reason you're not getting hired. So from a practical sense, this is really hard to implement. Now let's look at an example. Um, recently, Harvey gets fired from his job as a bartender for flirting with the customers. He's upset to find out that his previous manager for this job claimed he had been fired from every job he ever had for sexual misconduct when he provided a reference that Harvey really needed. In reality, Harvey had never been fired before this time. Will he be able to recover damages? Will he be able to get money in a lawsuit as a result of this? And this was a real case. The gentleman's name was Christopher Kane. Similar facts here. And he recovered $300,000 in damages for this defamation lawsuit. So it's very serious what you're saying in a reference about an employee. And you want to be careful okay, that you're not finding yourself in this sort of defamation suit. Now, as I mentioned previously, you know, if you hold information that could be, you know, really important, that could be potentially dangerous, you can find yourself in some trouble as well. You know, if you know that somebody is hurting people on the job and you're not telling them, then they might find that, you know, find out that that person's hurting people in the same way in the later job, you might have had an obligation to say something. Whistleblowing is also a big security feature that we have in the rules and regulations, but it's not as easy as it sounds. My students like to think of whistleblowers as snitches. I, I don't think that's the right terminology for this. You know, but it is someone who discloses illegal behavior of their employers. And it can be illegal conduct or just wrong conduct, okay? Things that they feel are unethical. You'll see many laws in place to help protect whistleblowers. Okay, but in actuality, it's not always as easy to say something when you see something wrong going on. You know, some famous whistleblowers you'll see pictured here. Let me zoom in here. Okay. Um, Cynthia, Cynthia Cooper of WorldCom or Sharon Watkins of Enron, for example. It wasn't easy to do what was right. In Cynthia Cooper's case, WorldCom was a big business in a very rural location. So coming out and saying what was right, you know, it made it so that the business shut down and all these people in her community lost their jobs. So she was kind of this pariah in the community. People didn't really like her because they saw her as the reason why they lost their, really their income, you know, in their jobs. And it made it difficult for her, at least at first, to find work in the same field. But she has this, these people probably giving her a poor reference and, you know, especially as there's more media attention around it, a lot of people are nervous about having someone who speaks up like that on the job. 
you know, she loses her job at first, and even if she shouldn't have, and even if she gets it back, thanks to the protections we see on the screen, as I mentioned earlier, many of us live paycheck to paycheck, so it's not practical, you know, to say, I'm not going to put food on the table for my kids, for my family, you know, not having a paycheck while I'm looking for work for multiple, multiple days, because I said what was right. So, it, yes, you know, in actuality, it sounds easy. Blow the whistle. If you see something wrong, say something. But keep in mind some of the reasons why people choose not to. You know, it's not an easy concept, which is why we have so many protections in place. We even have incentives to get people to say what's right. Okay, so you'll notice here a Forbes article about someone receiving $14 million by the Securities and Exchange Commission for saying what was right and which allowed the SEC to actually recover a lot of money and this person got a percent of it. Now there are also lots of safety and privacy protections in the workplace. In 1970, Congress passed what's known as the Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, to ensure safe working conditions. This regulation helps set specific health and safety standards. It obliges employers to keep the workplace free from recognized hazards and requires records of any injuries and accidents. It also allows for inspections of the workplace and finds if the conditions are unsafe. Now, you might not think this applies to you, but we see this applies to many workplaces. And so, if you're a manager of a store, for example, when I was a manager at AT&T, it was simple things like not stocking the boxes so high in the inventory room that they were blocking the ability for the water line to, the water, you'll notice little water things in the ceiling in case there's a fire, water can come down. If the boxes were stacked too high, it would block that water access, you know, or not allowing toasters in the break room. These are some small ways that you can help keep the workplace safe, and often as a manager, you'll have to make sure you're following those guidelines so there aren't these types of OSHA restrictions. For more information, you can certainly go to OSHA.gov. Privacy is another big area of the workplace, and I really like to make sure my students are aware of this because really under the common law, you have this reasonable expectation of privacy. But in the workplace, generally, I would assume you don't have any privacy to avoid issues. You know, in many places, off-duty conduct can't be regulated by the employer um, as state statutes exist in over half of the states protecting you to engage in legal activity off-duty. So things like smoking or drinking socially, being overweight, or um, dangerous hobbies like skydiving can be okay but remember, as an employee at will, if your employer doesn't like that you're drinking, you know, that's not discriminatory for firing you for being someone who's drinking or smoking. You know, even if they're legal for you to do where you are, if the employer doesn't support that, they don't have to keep you on the job. They don't have to hire you. And so unless you're in one of these states where there's extra protections at a state level, you know, they have a little bit of... <laughs> an ability to kind of get into what you're doing off the job as well as on the job. And another area that relates is alcohol and drug testing. Now this is allowed by private businesses, so you might find yourself being subject to a drug test either once you've already started a job or sometimes in the interview process. You know, usually this will be kind of the last screening stage before you actually can get hired. One of the big questions I keep getting from students is, well, you know, now that marijuana is okay, at a recreational level in so many places, you know, is it okay if a test shows up that, you know, I've been smoking marijuana and that's something that shows in the test? And the answer is no. At a federal level, it's still illegal to this day. And in your workplace, you're an employee at will. They have a right to choose not to hire you if you've been smoking. That's something I would discourage. Um, under the Employee Polygraph Protection Act of 1988, employers may not require or even suggest the use of lie detector tests. So unless it's an investigation of a crime, or if it's a firm that deals with a controlled substance, they really shouldn't be allowed to do this. Now the reason I push this issue of privacy is because this law that exists called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986, or the ECPA, please write this down and take a note of it, and be aware of it when you're on the job. This actually permits employers to monitor your telephone calls, your email messages, and even instant messages, as long as you consent, which you generally do by making use of these tools. Also, if the monitoring occurs in the ordinary course of business, or if it's an employer email. So you, you should not use your work email for personal things. Even using like a work internet and accessing a personal site from the work computer or the work internet, you know, is a gray area. 
So while case laws differed, unless you enjoy the prospect of having to be involved in litigation, it's really good advice to just consider using your own personal, you know, email and your own personal website on your own personal home computer on your own personal internet to avoid any issues. A good example of this is with social media. You know, you're on Facebook and you're out at a party, you're having a drink, maybe you're 21 and older, it's just one drink, everything's legal, and your friends post a picture of this and they tag you in it. So while you're not publicly sharing, hey, I've been drinking with people, you know, they're saying, hey, look, you know, this person drinks. Do you think you could be fired for posting this or for a friend posting this? You know, the answer, unfortunately, is yeah. An employer can generally fire you for having a personal website or blog it thinks is inappropriate, again, going back to that employment at will concept. Okay? Even if it's a not work-related website and you're not accessing it from an office, an employer can fire you if they feel the content on your personal site is offensive to them or clients or if it reflects badly on the company. So please, as a word of advice, just be careful what you're posting on the internet and to the public. It could come back to you. Now, not only could you be fired in interviewing for a job, an employer actually could obtain access to this picture and decide not to hire you. A lot of employers actually ask for social media passwords. I know that sounds crazy, but Maryland is one of the few states, they were the first state to outlaw this, and in many other states in a job interview, they can ask you for your password, and while you think it sounds crazy, if this person really wants the job, they might just give it to them. So luckily in Maryland, we're protected against that, and if you're not in Maryland, you might want to look into that further. Now there are also financial protections on the job. Congress and the states have enacted laws that provide employees with a measure of financial security. The big one to be aware of is what's known as the Fair Labor Standards Act. Passed in 1938, this act, or FLSA, regulates wages, so making sure that everyone gets paid a minimum wage and things like overtime pay, and it limits child labor. So at a federal level, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, there's a minimum wage of $7.25 an hour that must be paid, plus time and a half for any hours over 40 in one week. Now, while these don't apply to salaried workers, and men, there are many exceptions to this, you know, generally, most employers have to meet these minimum wage laws. Now, more than half of the states can set a higher rate. So they're still obliging by that $7.25 an hour if they're going to provide that in their state it's actually $10.25 an hour. So it's really important to check the state's guidelines. It can even vary by community. Now this law also prohibits oppressive child labor. So children under 14 can work like in agricultural, farming, they can work in the entertainment industry. Um, 14 and 15 year olds are permitted to work but generally they'll be limited hours non-hazardous jobs, and even 16 and 17 year olds. They can work unlimited hours, but the jobs have to be non-hazardous. We see a lot of protections in place under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, workers' compensation is another helpful resource. It ensures employees receive payment for injuries incurred at work, whether or not it's your fault. So they provide a fixed, certain recovery to an injured employee. Whether it was your fault you got hurt or it was your employer's, if you're on the job and you experience an inju injury, you can claim workers' compensation. The amounts allowed for things like medical expenses and lost wages under these statutes are often less than you'd recover if you went to court, but you trade that certainty of some recovery for the higher risk of rolling the dice at a trial. You never know what will happen at a trial. You'll have to pay for an attorney and it can be a long process. So this is like a nice, quick, easy way to access a resource when you've been hurt on the job. Okay, an administrative board is who actually will hear the claim for the workers' comp and approve it. So for more information on workers' comp claims in Maryland, you can go to that site. And let me share just an example of this. Um, let's say you're on the job and you're a cook and you go to turn on a really hot pan of boiling water and you're walking across the floor with this pan of boiling water and unfortunately, you didn't sleep much the night before, you're tired and you're not paying attention to what's around you. You walk into another employee and that water spills all over you. You get these boiling, awful feeling on your skin and third degree burns as a result. You know, was that the employer's fault or was that yours? You could argue that the floor was wet, you could argue that you, know, the, you had to carry it there because something about the way the kitchen was set up, but really, even if it's your fault, you can make a worker's comp claim. So this helps protect you, you know, on the job, and it's supposed to be a helpful resource.
Now, the Social Security system pays benefits to workers who are retired, disabled, or temporarily unemployed, and to spouses and children of disabled or deceased workers. It's financed through a tax on wages that's paid by employers, employees, and even the self-employed. So if you get a paycheck, you've probably seen this tax coming out. For more information, you can go to ssa.gov to learn more about the Social Security Act. Now, pensions are another financial security on the job. In 1974, Congress passed what's known as the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, which helps protect workers covered by private pension plans. It's very rare these days, but some employers still do provide pension plans. And here, while an employer is not required to provide that plan, if they do, they have to follow certain rules. It's aimed at protecting benefits of retired workers if the company goes bankrupt. What would happen is there'd be these workers who were supposed to receive a pension after working for a company for, let's say, 30 years. So they'd be very loyal to that company. They'd do everything they could. And then, unfortunately, year 28, the company goes bankrupt and says, sorry, we have no money left to pay your pension. You know, ERISA says that's not fair. So what they ask you to do is make sure that there's certain vesting of those benefits, you know, so that they can't cancel any vested benefits and they're not forfeited if an employee leaves, and if there is bankruptcy, that there's still some sort of fund in place to help pay them. Now, the last major topic when we talk about employment law is discrimination and the protections that exist out there. Now, discrimination is still a huge problem today. Whether it's overt, it's a little more under, you know, the wraps, you'll still see discrimination happening on many levels. So let's talk about some ways that the law helps to prevent this. One protection that's in place is what's known as the Equal Pay Act. Okay. In 1963, an employer may this law came to be and it allows that an employee may not be paid a lesser rate for equal work than opposite sex employees. Now you can find out more information here. There's a lot of information regarding what's known as a wage gap. So for those of you that are interested you can look into some of those materials. This wage gap says that supposedly women are paid you know something more than 70 percent less 70% uh, of what a man would be paid for the same job. Now keep in mind, pay can certainly differ. I can be paid less than a male colleague because I might have less years experience or less education or perhaps I didn't negotiate uh, my job, opening job salary as well. There are a number of reasons why different sexes can be paid different amounts of salary. The idea here is that it should not be simply based on gender. Okay, so while this is in place to help protect, and it's from so long ago, we still see issues of this in the workplace, and many of them are much more systemic. Okay, there can be issues of women going out there for maternity leave than men, and the types of jobs women are doing versus men that can contribute to this. So it's an interesting issue. Again, if you're interested in learning about this, there's more in the module for you. The major law that is important in terms of discrimination is what's known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, specifically Title VII of that act. This act prohibits employers from discriminating on the basis of sex, race, color, religion, or national origin. Now one of the questions students often ask me is, what's the difference between race and color? Why are those both there? Now even if you're the same race, there can be discrimination based on different shades of the skin color that you have within that race. And so both race and color are recognized groups that are protected under this law. Employers have to make reasonable accommodations under this law for any worker's religious beliefs unless it would cause an undue hardship. So for example, if you're Jewish and you are not able to work Friday night through Saturday due to Shabbat, you know, which is a Jewish holiday that's observed that does require you to kind of, you know, be a little more calmer. It might not make it so that you might not be able to commute to your work. You're not supposed to be working during that time. A lot of retail jobs, that's really a peak period. So that's something we'd have to tell the employer, I'm unable to work due to this reason. And if the employer can simply put somebody else on the schedule, they should do so. And if it's all hands on deck and they need everyone, that may be an argument where they don't need to provide you that time off. It's as simple as communicating and then accommodating you in a manner that's reasonable. Now affirmative action is not required by this law. It's not prohibited either. Affirmative action is where we are actually putting in place um, certain practices to help a, one of these groups. So maybe it's that you're having, you're hiring a certain number or considering women or, or a minority group 
in the hiring process to help provide them an opportunity because of the discrimination that's happened in the past. Some people would argue this type of affirmative action is also a form of discrimination. So it's again making choices based on these types of um, factors that are not job relevant. You know, it shouldn't matter if it's man versus woman. Sexual harassment is also something that falls under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. When we talk about the protected group of gender, that's where sexual harassment comes into terms. Just like pregnancy falls under there, that can be a form of gender discrimination if someone um, may not refuses to hire or fire someone because a woman is pregnant. So there are two types of sexual harassment you should be familiar with. The first is what's known as quid pro quo. This involves unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and any type of verbal or physical conduct of a sexual na nature. It's kind of like a I do this, you do this kind of a thing. There's an exchange going on. So this is normally what people think about when you think about sexual harassment. Um, it's something like your employer saying, go on a date with me and I'll consider you for this promotion or um, give me a kiss and I will read your article. You know, these types of exchanges are not appropriate in the workplace and are certainly a form of sexual harassment. Another form of sexual harassment besides quid pro quo is what's known as a hostile work environment. This may also be valid if sexual innuendo is so pervasive that it interferes with your ability to do your job. So while we think of a hostile work environment as any type of unwelcome touching like we see on the screen, you know, here the gentleman's giving her a massage and he might think he's being nice, but if she's offended and it's intruding on her personal space and she says no, she asks him to stop and he keeps doing it, that's when it becomes a hostile work environment. So keep in mind, you know, it is important to say something. If there's conduct going on that's making you uncomfortable, you know, tell them and give them the opportunity to resolve it. Go to human resources, try to resolve that conduct. But if you said this makes me uncomfortable and it continues, now it becomes hostile because they're ignoring the way not only you feel, but also, you know, objectively what would make someone uncomfortable. Not everyone might be uncomfortable by the shoulder massage, but if objectively most people are and you personally were offended, it can certainly be considered sexual harassment. So be careful about the types of um, touching that you share with your colleagues in the workplace, even if you're friendly, you know, because you could be making someone uncomfortable without realizing it. And hopefully they'll tell you that so you don't create the hostile work environment for them. The other type of sexual harassment in a hostile work environment that's not always as obvious is the type of conversation, innuendo, that makes someone that uncomfortable. You know, talking about a sexual conquest from the night before or making jokes about the way a woman looks. And if you're, someone's doing that around you and you're saying, please stop doing that and they keep doing that, that also can create a hostile work environment. So it doesn't have to be any physical touching involved. Any type of offensive conduct that's so pervasive and continuous, even with you saying, please stop, can create a hostile work environment and can be a sexual harassment claim. Now, under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in Title VII, we see gender protections, which have been expanded since then to help protect transgender and sexual preferences. Okay, so as we see different issues coming up and becoming more uh, out, more important in society where we see more issues going on in the workplace about them and it's becoming a bigger problem, we will see the law react. And here we see that in how the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has expanded gender to include any types of gender issues and sexual preferences. Now, a lot of my students get confused about this. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which protects a number of groups. There are other protections in place as well for certain groups. For example, Age Discrimination Employment Act, the ADEA of 1967, this is what protects people who are over age 40. So they would not be protected under the Civil Rights Act, they'd be protected under the ADEA. What this does is it tries to help prevent forced retirement at a certain age. Okay, unless it's uh, police or top-level corporate executives, generally, you can't be forced to retire just because you hit age 65. You know, um, what was happening was there was people who were really loyal to an organization for a number of years, and they're older than 40 then because they've been with the company so long, and then the company would go, wow, we're spending a lot of money for this person. Hey, maybe we could get rid of them, let them go, and replace them with two people a bit younger. And, you know, we can have two people doing one person's work or even more than that for half the cost. And they were starting to get rid of people who really had been loyal and should not have been treated in that way. 
if you're just being let go because of your age or being discriminated against in the hiring process because of your age, this act protects groups 40 and older. Now keep in mind this doesn't protect if you're too young. So for example, you know, my first big job I had coming out of undergrad was being a manager at at and and they didn't know he there just how young I was. You know, I was two years ahead in college, so you know, I was 19 coming out of college when most people would have been 21 or older. And so they assumed, I think, that I was older than I was, and I didn't mention it because I didn't want them to think I was any less experienced. I'd worked many, many years, like it was represented on my resume because I had started working at such a long, young age. And I didn't want to be treated differently because of that or not hired because of that. You know, ultimately it came to light because they were trying to take me out for a drink to celebrate my store and I wasn't legally able. And so, you know, at that point I approved myself after I had already had the job. And if they had turned around though and said, you know what, Hannah, you're just too young. We don't really want you here. Come back in a couple years when you're 21, you know, because I was 19 at the time, I wouldn't have any protection. You know, I'm an at-will employee, remember that. Uh, there's no protection in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for being discriminated against because of your age. Under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, there's only protection for people 40 and older. So being discriminated against because I was too young at that time was not protected. So keep that in mind. Again, you're at will unless you fall under one of these protected groups. Another really big law that helps protect another group is what's known as the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this applies on the job and at school. Here, a disabled person is considered someone with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, or someone who's regarded as having such an impairment. In general, an employer may not disqualify a job applicant or, employee or an employee because of a disability, as long as they can, with reasonable accommodation, perform the essential functions of the job, meaning it won't create some type of undue hardship. It's not going to be hilariously expensive for the employer. So for example, um, if I have a student in class who has a hard time seeing, you know, and they're asking, hey, can you make the font larger or let me sit in the front of the classroom, then those are reasonable accommodations. That's not going to be a huge, huge problem for me to make that accommodation. Just like on the job, if you have someone who, you know, um, has arthritis and it hurts their hands but they need to be on the phone and holding a phone, a headset is, you know, $15, $20 to get them a headset so they can still speak on the phone without having to use their hands, that's a reasonable accommodation. Okay, something that's going to cost multi-million dollars to, to install or to do or to buy the software, that's going to be another story. Now, unfortunately, employers get around this. They put things in their job descriptions like need to be able to lift um, 20 pounds as an essential function of the job. You need to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. So if you're in a situation where you're unable to lift 20 pounds because you have you know, arthritis and it's hard for you to pick up those boxes because it's just such a bad arthritis, that's going to restrict you from even applying to the job and it can be totally reasonable because they made it an essential function. So in a, a practical stance, this doesn't always work so well. So how do we prove that there's discrimination anyway? There are a couple of different ways you can prove a discrimination claim. One is through what's called disparate treatment, which is probably the one you're more familiar with. The other is what's known as disparate impact. Under disparate treatment, you have to show you're treated differently because of things like sex, race, color, religion, national origin, some of the protected groups we just discussed. There has to be evidence that the employer, the defendant, discriminates based on that particular trait. Okay, so if you think about this, if I fire a black woman who is 60 years old, I fire her from working for me because I think she's a bad employee. Remember, she's an at-will employee, and if she's not performing her job, and I let her go because she's not performing the job, that's totally okay. But, you know, if it was because of the fact that she was 60 years old, she has protections under the uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Or if it was simply because of her gender, or because of her race. You know, if it wasn't because of how she's performing her job, if it was for one of those protected groups that are protected under these different laws, discrimination protection laws we've discussed, then she's going, then she's going to have a legal claim. And so it's important, you know, even if it's not valid, even if I feel it was because of bad conduct, and she can make an argument there's discrimination going on here, 
So one of the things that's very important that I let employers know is if there is bad conduct going on, it's very important you're not inflating performance evaluations. If I'm giving her a bunch of evaluations every quarter saying she's doing her job really well, and then I'm trying to argue it's not discrimination, it's because she's not performing well, but all of the information I have on her record says she's a great employee, it's not going to look great. So one of the things you can do is, you know, make sure you're writing down when someone's not performing well and communicating with them so they have an opportunity to fix it. And that way you also have a record. You know, if she's late multiple times, you know, keeping track of when she's late and having a conversation with her helps to show that it's poor performance, you know, rather than discrimination, just to be safe. Now, if you are just outright discriminating, we have laws that help protect that. And so I'll tell you more about how to file a claim if that's the case. Now disparate impact is one that's a little different. Now disparate treatment as we see on the last screen is more of this like an intentional discrimination that we think about when we think of discrimination. Disparate impact applies if you have a rule that on its face isn't discriminatory, but in practice you end up excluding too many people in a protected group. So you have to show that the policy has a greater impact on a protected group than a non-protected group. Okay, and the defendant, the employer, then needs to show it's necessary for the job. So for instance, you might have a test to allow someone to work in the job, and as a result of that test, even though it wasn't meant to be discriminatory, only men are getting promoted, only men are getting hired. You know, again, it's not intentional, but it's having this discriminatory impact. That's what's known as disparate impact. Okay, so we still want to make sure we're protecting against those kinds of things as well. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Some of the defenses are merit. A defendant, an employer, won't be liable if they show the person that they favored was the most qualified. I chose this person not because of their gender, not because of their race. They have ample years of education and experience compared to this other person I chose for the job. Okay, so test results, education, or productivity can all be used to demonstrate merit, okay, provided that they relate to the job that's in question. Another defense can simply be in seniority. There can be a legitimate seniority system, and that's totally legal, even if it perpetuates past discrimination. This means the longer they work there, the more senior they are. Okay, and that might give benefits to one group over another, but if it's a legitimate seniority system, it's going to be okay. So for instance, many employers offer a seniority system for the offices. You know, who gets the biggest office, the one with the windows, the best location, will generally be based on who's been there the longest. Okay, and that's all right. It's not, hey, you know, that we gave Hannah the, the office because she's a woman. You know, instead it's Hannah's been with the workplace the longest. It's a legitimate seniority system for her to take that office. Now the last defense is one that's very, very rare. I want to tell you about it, but understand it's really not going to be a great defense in practice because the court rarely accept it, accepts it. It's what's known as a BFOQ, a bona fide occupational qualification. Here, an employer is actually permitted to have a discriminatory job requirement if it's essential to the job. The business has to show that it can't fulfill its primary function unless it discriminates. Okay, so generally the courts aren't sympathetic to this because we want to avoid discrimination. So we look to what's going on with the heart of the business. Is this discrimination necessary for the business itself to operate? One of the famous cases around this had to do with Southwest Airlines. And you might recognize Southwest Airlines with their branding as the love industry. You know, back in the day, Southwest was really big on trying to establish itself as this type of sexy airline for, the bus for businessmen, really. And so they tried to hire kind of sexy stewardess, you know, to help out on the planes. And the whole idea of it was to have this love industry. But if you think about Southwest Airlines, the heart of their business is to get you from point A to point B. It's not about this sexy travel experience. So when they were only hiring women as stewardess, and a man applied for the job of being a steward and was denied, they filed a discrimination claim under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, gender is a protected group. So if a man can't get a job based on the fact that he's a man, as what was happening with Southwest, that's certainly discrimination. When we look at disparate treatment versus disparate impact, that's disparate treatment. And it's very intentional. And Southwest argued, well, we're trying to have this sexy airline, we're the love in airline, you know, this is what our atmosphere is supposed to be on our planes, we only want women on the planes, and they tried to argue this BFOQ, this bona fide occupational qualification, it 
did not stand up in court. And we know that because today if you're flying on Southwest, you'll find both men and women operate helping to provide services on those planes, giving you the peanuts and your uh, drink for the flight. That's going to be okay for either men or women. So it's interesting to see how some of these claims happen. You know, in rare instances, like let's say a female prison, then you might discriminate against a male guard because you want to have women guards, especially in certain places like those locker rooms. So let's bring it all together. Let's look at a workplace rights scenario. Jane is a mother of three. She's 52 years old. Her wages are comparable to other female colleagues. John's the boss. He doesn't like his new employee, Jane. John doesn't really have a reason. He just really thinks she's kind of annoying. So he fires her. Does Jane have a legal claim for being fired? And if she does sue, which law applies? So you'll see some of the applicable laws we spoke about today. The first being the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII. There could be a gender discrimination claim. You know, even if it's just because he doesn't really like her, she's not doing the job so well. You know, gender is one of the protected groups under the Civil Rights Act. So she can claim it's based on the fact that she's a woman. She was fired. We also see the Family and Medical Leave Act coming into play. Uh, let's say she's taking any leave to be with her children. You know, she can argue that that's something that's protected under FMLA and that leave should be protected at least for 12 weeks, even though it's unpaid. Under the Equal Pay Act, wages should be comparable, male employees to female employees. She can make some arguments there. And she is also 52, which is older than 40, so she might also have some protections under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Now, hopefully, it gets across that John just didn't like her. He wasn't discriminatory. But keep in mind all these possible claims she can bring against him, which, you know, can be a long, drawn-out legal process. It could also end up being bad public relations for the company. You know, if it even gives the appearance that they're not treating women well or people who are older than 40 well, you know, that can be bad to, for the public image for the business. So that's something to keep in mind. And while these protections are in place to help, because they're so important, I want to give you a couple resources, both as an employer and as an employee. The big one I want to show you is WorkplaceFairness.org. The other one, just to show you for today, is that if you want to file a discrimination charge and launch a complaint of discrimination, they actually have free services to help you that were formed under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. So don't be afraid to file a complaint if needed through this site. Now, I do want to show you WorkplaceFairness.org. This is a nonprofit I used to serve on the board for, and I feel like they're doing such great work, I like to make sure all my students are familiar with it. Okay, you'll see on the Workplace Fairness site, let me just expand here a little bit. Okay, this is their site. There's a custom search. It says, Working People, our number one most comprehensive online resource for free information about your workplace rights. Okay, here we find out a lot of information for both employers and employees about your rights in the workplace. When we have these conversations, I get a lot of questions from students about things they're experiencing on the job. Even if you're not having a bad experience now or you're not working now, a friend or a family member might, or you might experience something like this in the future. So please hold on to WorkplaceFairness.org. What I love about it is it takes all the legal jargon out of the issues we see on the job to make it more understandable and easy to know what our rights are. So here, for example, looking at unpaid wage and hour problems. What's really neat is it does this in a frequently asked question format. So I can look here and find out about when I'm allowed to take breaks. Now keep in mind there can be federal laws and state laws around a lot of these topics. So it might depend on what state you're in. This links to a lot of great information. So for example, they give me a meal break but they don't pay me for it. Is it legal? Under the Fair Labor Standards Act that we learned about, meal breaks are generally not considered work time and are not required to be paid as long as they meet these two criteria. The employee has to be completely relieved from their duty. They have to be able to actually like, leave and have a meal. And the meal period is 30 minutes or more. Employees are not considered completely relieved from duty if they're required to perform any duties, you know, even if it's just being on call. So we see questions that come up and whether or not it's okay. It answers to them through this site. So I encourage you to take a look at it and learn more. I hope you found this presentation to be helpful regarding employment law, learning more about what you as an employer or an employee should know in the workplace. Thank you.